going on right now is there's a lot of media that is yelling and screaming blockchain this, blockchain that, but that word on its own is quite meaningless. It's equivalent to a database, you can just say. So uh, this video really kind of outlines that, that if, if someone's peddling blockchain this or blockchain that at you, and that's all they're saying, they're peddling databases too. And they're not actually peddling any real innovation. Uh, and that's where this video comes into play, is it dispels some of the myths that are being perpetuated by large institutions uh, and organizations that, uh, and all the big players are in, the, are in it right now, right? You have, as far as tech companies, you got Microsoft and IBM and, uh, uh, then you've got large governments, even the Canadian government has been experimenting with blockchains, <laughs> CanCoin they call it, CanCoin, uh, for the last uh, almost two years actually. And uh, then you have uh, all the other central banks are very interested in what's going on with that because this could threaten their livelihood. Uh, decentralized money, oh my goodness. They don't like that. So uh, you have the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, you have the Federal Reserve, you have all the other central banks. Interesting enough, Japan has approved Bitcoin as a currency that can be used uh, uh, to uh, you know, buy and sell. Uh, so some people are more open to it. Some have uh, sort of reserved judgments. Uh, one thing that's typical uh, has been um, a little more pervasive is the thought that if you buy and sell cryptocurrencies and you go back into your your national currency that's a capital gains and then you would be taxed on that that's as kind of as far as it's gone so far but um, of course the uh, original innovation was Bitcoin and there's more and blockchain is part of that there's more to it and that's what this video gets into. And hopefully, uh, if you've not really studied this stuff, it'll clear it all out. And it's presented by uh, what I believe is the most preeminent educator in the world on the topic. His name is Andreas Antonopoulos. If you watch YouTube, you probably come up against some of his videos. If not, this is the guy you should. He, uh, he's written a book called Mastering Bitcoin and gets into the technical details. It's for technical people. But this video is not for technical people, it's for non-technical people who really uh, have no idea what a blockchain is or what Bitcoin is and what's the differences and all that sort of stuff. So if we'd like to watch it, it's 20 minutes and it's done at a slow pace so that you get the message. And the reason for that is, like Bob challenged me, hey, can you, can you give it to us in five minutes? And I'll give you an analogy here. If you remember the internet, the beginning of the commercial internet, and we were all kind of starting to get online. One of the big players was AOL, and they were distributing disks to every, every household and say, here's how to get online. Well, it was a vanilla form of the internet. It was sterile and very uninteresting. And then later came along local internet service providers and now and then we got connected to the more interesting stuff of the internet and that's kind of where this is going if you just want to know about blockchain you're going to get vanilla if you want to know about bitcoin and and some of the other technologies that go into it which uh, uh then you're going to get into the more interesting ideas and innovation that is possible in this space So well, let's see what we get. Um, we did a really bad job of introducing Chris. Well, this is Chris Stinson. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I can, yeah. I can give you, a, I can give you the one minute spiel about myself. Okay, so uh, I, uh, my background is as a creative. Uh, in my late teen years, I got into music, played in the band, did all that sort of stuff. Became a concert promoter, later an artist manager, and then. A few years later, I took up a new art form, which was partnered dancing. Uh, I started out actually with line dancing, believe it or not. I just wanted to improve my coordination. 
That led into writing two books, which I've self-published, and they're on Apple, Amazon, and Kobo, uh, related to partner dancing. And uh, I'm currently writing my third book, which goes back to my roots in music, uh, trying to distill the social mechanics of the music industry, the stuff that doesn't change. So if you want to be successful in the music industry, yes, you do know you do need to keep up on technological advancements, but that's not the real industry. It's really about bands and fans or artists and audiences and understanding why is there any attraction there. Music is not something we need to exist and yet we treat it with something we value highly. So I get into that sort of stuff. So I, I like social mechanical things and that relates into uh, this sort of stuff uh, because this technology is all about social connection, peer to peer. Uh, and uh, um, there's a, when you get dive into it, you can realize you can, your imagination starts to whirl around and I've got connected some ideas of my own of how music industry could be handed back to the populace and taken away from, uh, the uh, the uh, centralized entities that try to really suck and skim all the money they can off of uh, off of artists and audiences they could be done away with so I'm pointing fingers at the big record labels and uh, Ticketmaster and so forth and we can we can take out all of those people through the use of decentralized crypto technologies uh, uh, that have yet to come on board but there's there's, uh, there's lots of innovation happening there, and maybe one day I'll actually write uh, a yellow paper, not maybe, maybe not, I'll need the assistance of a technical writer to write a white paper, but something that's less technical that could present this, uh, this sort of stuff. That's, that's me, that's, so my first passion is music and the arts, and then it connects with this stuff. And uh, I'm really excited about where this is going. It's, we are, you guys in the room right now are if you get into this stuff or in, or in it now, you are before early adopter phase. We haven't even reached early adopter phase. This is the crazy period phase, okay? <laughs> so if you're in it, you must have a strong stomach <laughs> if you've got skin in the game, okay? Because this stuff is very volatile but very interesting. It, um, and that's basically all I gotta say. Yeah. To expand his his interest even further i met chris at i think the wordpress uh, oh yeah yeah at uh, no, it, we're, we're, originally we're, in the park last time, but yeah. originally at the non-violence festival in the park yes uh, talking about politics and, and electoral yes. systems right so yeah, yeah that's, and this will come into the play there there's uh, interesting ways where voting can take place <laughs> so nick's got an interest in that too so. uh voting could uh, be done in uh, unique ways uh uh through what they call decentralized autonomous organizations or DAOs. That means that you have a cryptographic token that's unique, and you it, and whoever has in possession one of these unique tokens could submit it to a voting uh, uh, booth, uh, electronic out there in, in the on the blockchain, and your vote could be recorded as to how you voted. This is already happening in does some situations. Does it preserve anonymity? Anonymity though. Uh, it depends on the technology that's being used, uh, this, the type of signatures. So, so for instance, uh, some signatures are pseudo-anonymous and some signatures uh, are, are very open. You could attach your name to it. And then some signatures could be completely anonymous, uh, such as uh, ring signatures. Uh, Monero is one of the pioneers in that. Uh, and then there's other uh, uh, technologies that are coming along with very anonymous features where, yeah, you know what happened. There was a transaction in place that took place, but uh, uh, you don't know who it was. Okay. All you know is that the, you had a cryptographic recognized token and you submit it and it can be confirmed that it was submitted and okay. received. I guess the other, the follow-up question would be, how does one prevent the sales, uh, the selling of votes. If I can do it on my phone, then somebody can, I can say, yeah, there, give me my 20 bucks. You can't do that in a voting booth because you have to be alone. Right, yeah, so there's there's still some stuff that work that needs to be done thinking about voting systems, but it's coming. Uh, at, at, I do know of decentralized autonomous organizations that already exist. So one of them, uh, maybe we'll get into this, just brief this question. This is of interest. I, I, don't so, want, yeah, I don't want to take us too far off yeah. on <laughs> tangent, but I, I always do throw it there when the, the topic of electronic voting comes up. Yes. 
you go to the polls, you go to the voting booth, and you'll see every 80-year-old in the riding with their oxygen tanks and their wheelchair <laughs> yeah. chairs are there voting. Yes. And all the younger demographic that lives off their phone and they don't and they, they don't vote. And right. then we say afterwards, oh man, another 55% uh, right. turnout. Maybe we should expand it so that people, so that the youth today will vote online or something. Like, no. Yeah. 80 year olds can get out here, 16, 18 year olds can get out and vote. Sure. That's to me the first thing. Yeah, we're about. probably pretty Sorry. far away <laughs> from, we're, in truth, we're probably quite far away from like a strong, robust, uh, cryptographically secure voting systems like where populaces, large populaces are doing that. You're, it, it's more applicable to smaller groups uh, if you're interested in that. Uh, uh, smaller groups that where you still want to keep some level of anonymity if you want or if you want to be completely open, that's up to you and how you design it. Uh, but yeah, large, like for a, large countries, no, we're not there. We're probably very far away from that. Uh, there, there are non-blockchain techniques for doing that. Yeah. I've got an interesting lecture at, at U of W. Okay. Josh Benelow from, uh, from Microsoft, a photographer there, has come up with some techniques called homomorphic encryption, where right. you can completely encrypt the ballots so that they are unidentifiable, but then perform operations on the encrypted data which matches the operations on the non-encrypted data. So you can add ballots. I mean, you know, voting is just essentially counting. So. Mm -hmm. At any rate, um, yeah. should we do the yeah, video? Let's, uh, let's go into this. Okay. Yeah. So the first uh, part of my presentation discussing Bitcoin and doing an introductory conversation about uh, Bitcoin. And you may have heard this term blockchain. Uh, in fact, it's on a poster. It's on all the posters. Blockchain and cryptocurrency. What on earth is a blockchain? And what does it have to do with Bitcoin? So, Bitcoin is a foundational technology. Bitcoin is the technology that started it all. Bitcoin is the parent, and it has spawned many tribes because many children, because it is successful. And as a successful technology, it has created a number of other opportunities. When people use the term blockchain, they are referring to one technology that is part of Bitcoin. It is perhaps the most visible technology, which is the database that stores transactions, the public ledger, the list of all transactions that has happened. It's a decentralized, replicated database, for those of you who are interested in the technical terms. That is what a blockchain is. But people don't use it to mean that. People use the term blockchain to mean things that are kind of like Bitcoin, things that do what Bitcoin does and then some, and all of the other applications that have nothing to do with money. And then the banks go, and some of the things we do, but we would like to call blockchain to seem like we're doing innovations. And then the consultants go to the banks and say, and you can also call blockchain doing exactly what you used to do business as usual without being disrupted at all, and we're sure we can make it work for you if you pay us enough. As a result, nobody really knows what blockchain means. Blockchain is an industry. We have a saying that the most important meaning of blockchain is that if you go to Silicon Valley, go into your hotel room, turn off all the lights, stand in front of the mirror, and say, blockchain, 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 three times, 10 venture capitalists will jump out of the closets and throw millions of dollars at you. And that is true. That is true. I've seen it. He's part um, of a legal team, by the way. Blockchain in itself is meaningless. Blockchain is what we use to say the technology behind Bitcoin. Which is a bit like saying network is the technology behind the internet. And of course, if you're one of the industries that is being massively disrupted by the internet, maybe you want to say, hey, we can do network too. We don't want to do the public, messy, open, not very profitable, freedom bringing internet. But we can do network all day. As long as it's private controlled and profit making and we can charge by the minute, we can do network too. And if you think that's fiction, that's exactly what happened on the internet in the 90s. That's what the phone companies tried to do. They tried to create private internet, which was internet without any of the interesting things. It was internet where you needed a license and a registration and an account. Well now, a lot of companies are trying to do that with the Bitcoin space. So, blockchain means some interesting things. But it also means some not so interesting things, 
and it also means some things that are just announced by consultants to confuse enough to make some money on the side. I'm going to focus on the interesting things. <coughs> so how do you tell what a blockchain is and what a blockchain isn't? What are the things that are interesting about Bitcoin? What are the things that are interesting about the internet? Is the internet interesting because it offers you network? Is Bitcoin interesting because it does payments? To me, the interesting things are certain characteristics. What is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is a system of payments that is open. What does open mean? Open means anyone can access it, anyone can participate, anyone can innovate on the system without asking for permission. That's what open means. It is borderless. There are no borders. There are no borders on the internet. There are no borders in Bitcoin. The protocol simply does not see distinctions between countries. They are meaningless. It is neutral. It doesn't care if the participant is male, female, Christian, Muslim, old, young, rich, poor, brown, black, white, or whatever. The protocol doesn't care. It's neutral. It validates transactions. It's decentralized. There is no central point of control. It is censorship resistant. You cannot censor, freeze, or cancel transactions. Those are the things that make Bitcoin interesting. Arguably, those are the things that make the internet interesting. Right? That's why it's powerful. There are other blockchains that also share those characteristics. In fact, people have taken the basic recipe of Bitcoin, and in the first year they created two or three alternative coins. They were called altcoins. Since then, every year more and more and more and more. Today there are more than 1,500 blockchain-based systems that use the basic recipe of Bitcoin or variations of that design principle to create systems of currency, systems of trade, platforms, and various other things. These are all blockchains. Most of them share the interesting characteristics of Bitcoin. They are open, borderless, neutral, censorship resistant. Some do not. Of the 1,500, I would say more than 90% are worthless. And of those, more than 90% are probably scams. Their primary purpose is to enrich the people who created them. They see something successful, they try to create it. In fact, we have seen the emergence of a very large number of scams. Scams that are, in essence, Ponzi schemes. Who's familiar with the term Ponzi? Ponzi? Did you know that's the name of a guy? Mr. Ponzi. He inadvertently became famous. <laughs> Multi-layer marketing systems, pyramid schemes, right? So if you try to sell Bitcoin to someone, and I don't, I talk about it as an experimental technology that you should only invest in if you really understand how it works, and you should primarily invest in learning and understanding the technical skills that can turn this into an innovative industry, a startup business, a career, some opportunity for you as an individual. It's not a stock investment. And if you hear someone tell you that this system is an investment, it's a sure investment, it's a safe investment, it's a risk-free investment, or even worse, it is a system that is guaranteed to make you rich quickly, run away as fast as you can. Because those characteristics are shared by only one category of investments, scams. <coughs> Nothing in life is easy, risk-free, and will make you rich. So, Beware, especially in Southeast Asia, where you have very large numbers of new middle-class investors for the first time entering investment markets. Scam coins, Ponzi schemes, and multi-level marketing schemes are extremely popular. When you hear, this is like Bitcoin only will make you rich, go away, run away. Bitcoin will not make you rich. It can make you poor quickly. It is a volatile experimental system that comes with risks. I am advocating the understanding of this technology, which is enormously powerful, not the use of it as a speculative investment. Unless you need to use it and know how to use it, it's not an investment. Now, let's talk about some of the other systems that are out there. There are probably about a dozen other cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies is another term we use for these open blockchains, these public systems of ledger that can be used to build systems of trust. Some of them are very explicitly currencies. I'll mention just a few. You may have heard of them. Dash. Monero, Ethereum, Zcash, Litecoin, 
all of these are cryptocurrencies that are based on open public ledgers. They represent interesting technologies that are developing alongside Bitcoin. Many others are also growing. I do not recommend you use those as speculative investments either, but understand what they do and how they're different so that you can get a better picture of this industry as it emerges. Uh, my next book is on Ethereum, which I haven't talked about much. How many people here are familiar with Ethereum or have heard of it, used it? Great, a very large number of people. So for those of you who have not heard about Ethereum, Ethereum started uh, based on a paper published in 2013 by then 19-year-old Vitalik Buterin. Uh, I don't know that UW. Paper became public and called Vitalik to, to get some information about this. <coughs> I'm very skeptical, but I have been interested ever since, and I'm writing my next book on it. <coughs> the idea behind Ethereum is, if we can have this public ledger that is allowing us to trust and do computation at scale, how about instead of using it for money, we use it to run computer programs? And these computer programs run everywhere, and their results are recorded in a way that is immutable, persistent, and trustworthy by all of the participants. Global, secure, decentralized computation, not money. And it has a system of money called Ether. But what it really allows you to do, interestingly, is run smart contracts. The idea here is taking contractual arrangements, the kinds of things we would do in commercial contract law, or transactional law as it's known, and encode relationships and contractual obligations in software programs. If this happens, then do this, else do that. The way you would write a contract in a human spoken language is then encoding it in software. And then having that program of law execute on a global platform. Not funny, but it is part of this system of trust that is based on the same global blockchain phenomenon. So blockchain isn't just money. People have suggested using blockchain for a number of non-financial applications, mostly applications related to trust. One very common application is the registration of assets or ownership of tangible or non-tangible things. For example, and this is a big problem in developing nations and an area where blockchain can have a very large impact, is the registration of title over land and the ownership of assets like homes. So the possibility of using a blockchain is because if you record something on the blockchain, it cannot be modified. It is immutable. Once recorded on the blockchain, the system of trust prevents anyone from re reversing that, from overwriting that, from changing the past. So it creates a permanent, immutable record of history. In a real estate transaction, that is really important. That allows you to pass title on a piece of land from person to person independently, while no one being able to falsify that record or steal your land through paper. One of the most common forms of theft of land are with falsification of paper. You don't have to go into someone's land with guns and take it from them. If you can go to the local land registry office, bribe someone to change it into your name, and send the police into their land with guns to take it from them on your behalf. That kind of thing can really be affected by a blockchain. Other things are the re registration and access to assets. You can, for example, have the title of a car, a boat, an aircraft registered on the blockchain. We were having a discussion here in the waiting room with a gentleman from the airline industry, and one of the interesting applications we discussed is the ability to record maintenance records and parts in a blockchain in a way that they cannot be modified. If a plane crashes, I'm a private pilot, by the way, so this is an area of interest to me, but if a plane crashes, one of the first things you want to do is go back and look at the maintenance records and say, was the left jet engine actually inspected after 100 hours of operation as it's supposed to be? How can you tell in traditional forms if we have that written down on paper? I can write down today and put a date a month ago before the plane crash and say, look, it was inspected. You falsify the record after the fact. You can falsify a database after the fact. And witnesses are unreliable. How do you know what actually happened? A blockchain allows you to record the fact that an inspection happened and it cannot be modified or falsified after the fact. And it cannot be inserted in the future and pretend to be in the past. So these are elements where the same mechanism that's used to create trust for money and transactions can be used to record the truth in a permanent and usable record. These are the applications that most companies are fascinated by beyond money that have the general term blockchain. That's the good. Now let's talk about the bad and the ugly. 
That same term blockchain is used to mention a lot of things that do not have any basis in fact and don't actually work. What has become very fashionable lately is this idea that you can do blockchain without Bitcoin. As in, blockchain is good, but Bitcoin is bad. It's used by criminals, gamblers, degenerates. It's just money. One of the fundamental mechanisms behind the blockchain is security. Bitcoin allows you to have a system that is decentralized without a central point of control. By creating a competition in which those who provide security are rewarded in Bitcoin, the currency. So the currency in Bitcoin is not just a vehicle for doing value transactions, it is the basis of the mechanism of security. And that mechanism of security allows you to have a blockchain that is operated and secured by anonymous participants, whose only claim to providing security is that they submit as a promise for their security, and they risk energy, and they may gain as a return a reward in Bitcoin, unless they try to cheat, in which case they lose everything. That competition, that game, is the basis of Bitcoin security. But what that system of security allows you to do is have the system managed by everyone, so no one is in charge. Here's the problem. If you take away the system of reward, then there is no mechanism for punishment. If you take away the system of punishment for cheating, there is no security. Blockchains use a currency because they use a system of security that is based on market forces, on game theory. To use a blockchain without a currency, you have to find another way of doing security. And this is where the traditional institutions come in and say, I know, how about we assign five trusted institutions and they validate every block on the blockchain and make it a private blockchain where we control who has access. And since those five private institutions assign trust on the blockchain, if you trust those institutions, you can trust the blockchain. That is business as usual. That is blockchain being used to perpetuate the system of institutional trust that has failed, that has failed to scale. Only worse, if you use a blockchain in that kind of way, as a private closed system where trust is assigned to institutions, if those institutions are compromised, or their keys are stolen or hacked, because you've concentrated all of that power in just a few participants, that system is no longer secure. These are the same companies that get hacked every time we read on the news that someone got hacked. This is who we're supposed to trust to run these blockchains. The whole point of Bitcoin's open public blockchain is that through a system of currency, it creates security that does not depend on any one individual or institution. If you take the currency away, the security model disappears too, and you're back to a ledger that is controlled by a single entity or a few entities. We have a name for that. It's called a database. So this is the real question you should ask. How do you evaluate? The difference between blockchain, and as we would say in America, bullshit. <laughs> they both start with a B. <laughs> one of them is real, the other one isn't. One of them is used as the basis of a $12 billion global, secure, decentralized economy. And the other thing is the thing that the consultant is trying to sell. How can you tell the difference between real and not real? Ask the following questions. Is it open? Is it public? Is it borderless? Is it censorship resistant? Is it neutral? Can anyone access it without permission? Can anyone use it without permission? Can anyone innovate on it without permission? If the answer to all of those questions is yes, then it's giving you the values that we find so interesting in Bitcoin's blockchain. And you can say that for a number of other cryptocurrencies and blockchains, yes to all of those things. If you can take the entire brochure that describes this thing and you search and replace, and for every mention of blockchain, you can replace it with the word database. And then you read it and it still makes sense. You're not being sold a blockchain. You're being sold a database by a scam artist. And that's the difference between blockchain and bullshit. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, speaking of, of everybody, um, I know almost everybody in the room, and I keep making the same mistake every place I go. If I know everybody, I think everybody else knows everybody. <laughs> so I think we should probably do a quick roundy round of, of introductions, which I should have done right at the very beginning. 
uh, so that you know everybody at least knows who everybody is. So my name is Bob Jonkman. Um, Mark and Steve Isman and I inherited the uh, KW uh, NPSA group from uh, Paul Nidja, who's been running it for the last year and a half. Uh, he has other obligations at this point, so offered to uh, pass it on to others. And Mark and, uh, and I, and Steve, who's not here today, have uh, volunteered to take on the task. I hope we do as well as Paul has managed to do for the last year and a half. Mark? Hi, Mark. <laughs> and the other coordinator. <laughs> Um, uh, you're involved with a, a nonprofit organization? Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, with the Liberal Office and I uh, do volunteering uh, for them. And um, I'm also, I manage a group, a music group. Okay. So, and it's an uh, early music group of uh, 16th century music. Okay. Cool. Fun thing. Uh, I'm Nick Collins. I'm a software tester full time and hope to continue to be in the future. It's a new job I'm still in the three months probationary period, but fingers crossed it works out. Uh, outside of work, among a few volunteer activities I do, um, I help do website maintenance for uh, a local group, uh, KW Fibromyalgia Support Group. Uh, I know someone who's in that group and asked me to help them out when they lost their previous web uh, guy. Uh, so it was fun figuring everything out, uh, how it was set up, but I managed to get somewhere with that. It's not a super sophisticated site, it's just really basic informational. Um, but uh, some of the topics we discuss here kind of ties in with what I've been doing there. And uh, just because, you know, even as a software tester being in the industry, uh, the topics that we discuss in this group sometimes crossover between what's of interest to me, the volunteer or professional side to come along. Uh, Yang Li, uh, I'm a local resident, I mean, was no resident, but I work for a farm on the southern farm. Uh, I volunteer at the use of the constant heart as a cost of your for very nice and other international things. Uh, Ronald Barnes, I do Linux and databases and been covering with Docker lately, if I'm liking that. Uh, sort of, of no fixed address right now, don't know how long I'll be in the KW area, <coughs> where I grew up or when I'm going home to Vancouver, I don't know. I don't know. But uh, since I've got the floor for a moment, and we're speaking of blockchains, there's a story in the London Review of Books online I think Andrew O'Hagan is the author, and it's about not so much blockchains, but it's about what's his name, Chris Wright, S the Satoshi. Yeah, the guy who claimed to be called. Satoshi. Yeah. It is a Craig Craig Wright. Craig Wright. Yeah. Very long form story. It was meant to be a book, I believe, before Craig reneged on his "I'm the guy" sort of thing. <laughs> really well written really informative. It does go into the blockchain and stuff like that, so it's slightly tangential to tonight's topic, but a great read. London Review of Books. And he's the same author has a another one. He was going to write a book about um, the WikiLeaks dude, Assange, That's Julian that. Assange. And he was supposed to write a book, and Assange turned into such a flaky dip that the book again was reneged on, so he took all of his research and published a game, long form story about that. So if you're into these things, London Review of Books has got some great stuff on blockchains and Assange. Uh, Kirk Zarell, uh, Assistant Administrator at the Working Center. Uh, Mauro Cortez, I'm a civil engineer, so not, not much into technology, but I'm attracted to some, some of the topics. The uh, first time I heard that Bitcoin was four years ago, a friend from the Netherlands say, hey, let's, let's buy uh, some computers and let's start producing Bitcoin. And I said, you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it means. So just, just interested in the topic. Yeah. Uh, my name is Roche, and uh, I'm running the login for Plot Plot clients in IT industry or in the production or marketing. That's where I am. Uh, I'm Robert. I'm a computer guy. I do a lot of computer stuff. Uh, first heard about Bitcoin. I think it was back in like 2012. 
It was like uh, around a dollar or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. yeah. I had recently finished an internship at uh, OANDA, which is a Forex market maker in Toronto. I remember I, uh, uh, yes, I had met the CEO there once. I met him, I emailed him, and I said, hey, there's this thing like uh, called uh, Bitcoin. It'd probably never be anything, but uh, you may want to check it out. And uh, I think he never emailed, he never messaged me back, and I really regret not buying Bitcoin. And, and then I guess uh, later, when it was 200 bucks, I, uh, I finally bought some, but it, it was still really hard to buy. And then I think I sold it on the day that it peaked. And then uh, uh, after that, traded, uh, did, I did my last year of procrastinating at university was, I day traded some cryptocurrencies for a while. Cool. And, uh, uh, and also some altcoins. And uh, I had my, uh, I had my Bitcoins so, like distributed on like three different exchanges, and for a while, like every single exchange got completely hacked, and like <laughs> I lost all the Bitcoins. And then some of the I, I was doing some arbitrage between two right. exchanges, yeah. and then like on some, for some of these altcoins, and like then I was like, oh, maybe I can do this in five minutes. And then the blockchain forked between then, and so like I lost everything, and like it was, uh, and so then I got turned off to it for a while, and I decided to come back and revisit it now, see what the ecosystem is like. Mm -hmm. Good. Hi, I'm George, um, software developer for more than 30 years, seasoned with a lot of technologies, uh, hands-on experience with a few of them. I'm uh, familiar with Bitcoin and Ethereum and just want to see another point of view. Okay. So, I got a couple of questions out of the uh, out of the video. Of, uh, you want to field them or anybody else? I'll try to field whatever sure. questions I can answer. Yeah. Well, one question I actually have for the group is um, in, in your organizations, whether they be nonprofit organizations or, or otherwise, uh, is anybody actually using the blockchain technology to do authenticated, um, you know, non reversible transaction recording? Sorry, I didn't <laughs> say transactional because uh, I, I work for a consultant called, which basically is a regulatory compliance uh, So we we plan to use the uh, blockchain for the uh, it's called beneficial ownership for the legal entity. Okay. So it's not financial transaction, but just uh, the record. Of it. Okay. One of the things that, that caught my eye was uh, something called block off, which is um, an authentication and identification technology. I have no clue how that works. So I was kind of hoping to ask block you Block off? Block off, A-U-T-H. Mm -hmm. Not familiar with that one. I think there's a one thing that I need to make a comment is uh, the content you put in is still outside the blockchain, right? So if you put in the fake information, the fake information will, will, will be mm -hmm. preserved, right? Yeah. So identification part, I mean, so far to my understanding, all the technology have to rely on other mechanism, for example, to verify the identity is true, right? Which is outside of the blockchain. Okay. So, so yeah, uh, so I can speak to that. Uh, uh, so um, maybe let's put up a website uh, and uh, this will uh, show some of the top technologies. Okay, so if you could go to a website called coinmarketcap.com. Yeah. So this is an excellent resource site to see kind of where the space is at, where technologies are happening. You scroll down a little bit, Bob. Uh, number nine right there, Augur. That is a prediction market, okay? So what people do is, let's say they want to wager on the outcome of an election or something. They can say, okay, well, uh, it's like, imagine bookies, like taking bets. And part of the, what they do is they'll say, okay, we're gonna trust a certain oracle, and an oracle being a news website or something that will report on the outcome of, say, the election, you know, an election, whoever won. And when that, so the, it is a, essentially a smart contract that you create. And the smart contract will gather that information from the oracle, which is a website, a news organization that party the parties in the in the contract trust and uh, gathers that information. It says who won, and then based on the outcome, uh, the parties get paid out whether they win or lose. Okay, so you can do stuff like that where 
uh, it's kind of relating to what you, I think you're getting at, which is, okay, you need um, a certain bit of outside information, um, uh, but you have to specify what that outside for information, where it's coming from and when it's going to come from, all these details, right? And then once that comes into the smart contract, then uh, you can uh, decide what happens in the contract. It's very if-then kind of simple sorts of stuff. Now, Augur is uh, something that's been created on the Ethereum platform, which was mentioned in the video. Um, there are There is an Ethereum meetup in the area. Uh, maybe two, actually. I'm not sure. I've been to the, one of them that was at, used to be hosted here in the Tannery building. Um, what, uh, Scroll back up a little bit, Bob. Just at a, just as an aside, you'll see number two and number seven. There's two Ethereum's. <laughs> well, uh, this space is really interesting. Last year we had a big event uh, where the Ethereum, uh, a lot, but a bunch of Ethereum developers, they created the first DAO decentralized autonomous organization and it was designed to be a venture capital uh, organization so uh, if you bought into the DAO and you bought the tokens that signified your ownership and, and your stake in the DAO you got voting rights on how the venture capital that was pooled together how it could be uh, uh, spent into other entities and so forth this was a smart contract uh, the language that uh, Ethereum uses is a Turing complete language. Um, some of you guys probably know what that means. The logic behind uh, Turing complete languages can be problematic because it is not decidable logic. You have to run the code in order to figure out what it does. And if there's any bugs, oh boy. Well, there was a bug. More like... Uh, loophole. And you see, Ethereum presents this idea of, of smart contracts, that the code that is there is the law. And this was what was written in this, how it was presented, uh, the DAO, the Ethereum DAO. And uh, what happened was someone smart out there read the code and saw a weakness in it, something the developers did it. And guess what? They withdrew millions and millions of dollars into their own account and they said publicly later, we think, we don't know for sure, but someone wrote an email, public email, and said, yeah, thanks for creating the DAO. Actually, I saw something really interesting in the code and it allows me to do this. So I want to thank you for letting me do this. Well. This caused a big controversy because someone walked away with, I think, um, greater than $90 million. And uh, what happened <laughs> was the developers and the, the core developers in the Ethereum project and a lot of other people were really pissed off. They thought that this was a hack. Well, it was more like an exploit. And this is a gray area, right? So, uh, the uh, decided to re reverse what happened transactionally and this is gets into an ideology of, of people in the blockchain space these this stuff that the ledger is supposed to be immutable that means it doesn't change what happens happens okay well they rolled it back how did they do that they they got the miners to get together and the miners, if you have more than 51 or 51%, roughly 51, 50 point, whatever, more, than more, more than 50, you can uh, actually, they use this popularly, attack the network and sustain, and you have to sustain that attack to roll back history. And what they, they did this, uh, but there was dissenters people that didn't like that, and uh, some of the, uh, some large exchanges that, that allow you to transact and trade these currencies, they, uh, they went along with it. And they issued Ethereum Classic number seven. 
And that's the original so those Ethereum are, blockchain without the rollback. Those are just two forks of the same? Yes, so this is identifying a fork in, in the road where you have the rolled back uh, event of Ethereum and you have Ethereum Classic, which is the original blockchain. So you have it split like this. So in, that could only happen, you could only authenticate the, the new fork, I mean, either branch is a new fork, by having 50% of the miners participating on that branch. Right. So what happened is you had miners that participated in the new branch, which is Ethereum number two, and you had old miners that continued to mine the old chain, and that's Ethereum Classic. So you had a divergence. You had dip two new groups, or like one whole new group of miners and uh, another group that continued on the old chain. And the exchanges, uh, some of them, they said, hey, if you used to own Ethereum, we're going to give you in your account Ethereum Classic because you had that before. We're gonna give you both because it's your right. And in truth, that is your right. So right now, what's happening is there's a lot of controversy in Bitcoin about doing a fork, a hard fork. This is a hard fork. This is about rolling back history and changing it. So uh, in Bitcoin, there's talk about a hard fork <coughs> and a soft fork. And we can get into that too if you want to talk about it. That's more higher level stuff. But um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, this is, uh, if, you, if, if you have Bitcoin and there is a hard fork, <coughs> you will have the new Bitcoin and the old Bitcoin. You will have both. You don't actually get a race. One doesn't get a race. What's to you, prevent that from happening in, in any of these? Great instances? question, yeah. So, so what's to prevent it is the mining network itself and they they uh rate the the uh robustness of the mining network on on a on a something they call hashing power this is just think gigahertz you know like of your piece your pc your chip you know the stronger and the gigahertz you have the more power you have so mining power is rated in hash power and the more hash power of the entire network, the harder it is to fork or to do, perform what is known as a 51% attack. And uh, so Bitcoin is the most robust network because it has the most hashing power. So at this- the, That's the number of mining participants. Uh, yeah, you can think of it that way. Yeah, the, the combined uh, com computational power of all the participants. I think it uh, yeah. takes in consideration also the CPU power. Yeah, in yeah. the end, it, it, uh, it comes down from what I read. It comes down to actually power, kilowatts, yes. energy yeah, yeah, used, yeah. Uh, so, like CPU or GPU. Yeah, yeah. if you wanted to power. take over the Bitcoin network right now, you would have, a, 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 so you're a bad actor, you want to take it over, you're going to have a crap load of difficulty based upon the amount of CPU power that's already been dedicated. And keep in mind, these computers that have been dedicated to the network are what call, are called ASICs, Application Specific Integrated Circuits. That's mean, that means they only do this one task. So you need, to, in order to compete with that, you need uh, probably hundreds of millions of dollars of the same kinds of- Specifically designed to only do this task. Exactly. As to a general purpose you would need GPU or a, just a ginormous amount of money just to get the equipment. And by that time, people are probably, the market is already tipped off. You can't buy ASICs in that quantity and, not, and, and people not know about it. And the mining pools that already exist, guess what? They're in it for money, for business, and they're not gonna give that up lightly. So they already know the, the game. And that's what the video talked about, is that there's market forces that come into play to protect it, right? So if you've got skin in the game, you're there to protect your skin yeah, in the game. There's a YouTube video of like yeah. one of those in China, and mm -hmm. it's like, a, it's just a massive like warehouse of nothing yes. but that everywhere. Yeah. Exactly. Like that's a, that's, a that's all it is, yeah. Can, can you touch on how the 50% plus of yeah. it works? Because I thought that 
and I don't know much about it, I thought that all that they could do in that situation was block other people from registering their mined coins so that if two people were to come up with the same hash, if I, I'm part of a 57% group, we block all of you guys out and me and my friends in the next room are going to register that and, and populate the blockchain. So the so way, how you yeah, the way it that? works, uh, so we're talking about a chain, which is a, a sort of, and blocks, and these blocks get added to one another. Well, there are times when uh, we don't actually know, like there's blocks being mined, but the rule of the way that the network is designed is that the longest chain wins, okay? There's any, any, any blocks that get mined are, and are shorter than the longest chain, they get discarded, okay? So uh, this is the way I understand it. And so if you are doing a 51% attack, that means that you are the one that's mining all the blocks and creating the longest chain. And it's at that point, you have to keep on sustaining that over a long period of time. It would mean weeks, actually. Weeks of mining the longest chain in order to roll back history. That's how powerful the Bitcoin blockchain is as it is today. So, go ahead. So, what do we mean to someone that has no idea about Bitcoin? Like we yes. By rolling back the chain. Or yeah. What does that mean? It's like rewriting history. So, um, so he, uh, this, uh, the blockchain, like what he, the, the speaker was saying, is equated to a database. So what we're doing is every 10 minutes, a new block records, it is a record of all the transactions that happened in the database. And but that- graphically signed, so it's ensured that it was the way that it was. That it yeah, was. And, the, and the way you uh, get the reward for producing a block is you have to, as a miner, you have to solve a difficult uh, algorithm, uh, an algorithmic problem. If you solve that first, then you get to create the next block and you get and process all those transactions and you get rewarded for that. Okay, so, so uh, it's obviously the incentive is there to be the, the largest miner, the uh, to earn the reward. So that's why you want to perform a 51% attack, not only to rewrite history, but to be compensated for processing transactions and whatnot. But if you are, if you have the 51%, you can do whatever you want with that network. Okay. So, okay. Is, so is, does that, does that answer your question? <coughs> Or Someone, you can ask some more, so go ahead. Just, uh, if, if this is based in computational power, yes, will quantum computer change the game? Is yeah, it? good good question. Yes, it would. Uh, if you had a, a functioning, we don't really know what the quantum computers that exist today are actually legit. Mm -hmm. They say they're legit, but they, there's no, uh, no real way of knowing if they can run software and execute programs. Uh, it, hasn't been proven. it hasn't been proven. It's still very theor theoretical. But yes, if you, the theor in theory, if you had a quant quantum computer, it would break all uh, existing encryptions that today. Uh, now I've heard, uh, yeah, okay, you, maybe you might know more about that. There, there's quantum safe encryption that exists. Yeah, there's. Uh, I heard a, a professor from Stanford University um, uh, talk about this specific issue. And uh, he uh, said, yes, we're working on new, new uh, technology to thwart quantum computers before they even arrive. Um, two things in particular, uh, one called BLS signatures and a second uh, technology. I don't trust, I, I can regurgitate the stuff he said. I don't know what it means, by the way. So take that as you will. Uh, BLS signatures and uh, something called a form of math called integer lattices, which uh, is supposed to thwart the, yeah, you don't, none of us know what that means, okay? So, yes, there's already people working on that, that potential problem, so, right now. And they're close, <coughs> they're, they say they're close, they, and by close, maybe three years away, is what they mean by that, so, uh, yeah. I heard a couple of years back that the Winklevoss brothers, who were instrumental in, uh, you know, not getting Facebook, yeah. um, had actually purchased enough 
mining power, mm -hmm. they own well over 50% of the mining capacity for mm. the Bitcoin product. Okay. Um, you know, they've, they've invested lots of money in purchasing Bitcoin, they've invested lots of money in, um, in making sure they've got the capacity to, to process this. Mm -hmm. they, they bought a whole exchange at some point. Um, doesn't that just wreck the whole concept of, of independently verifiable blockchain if, if one actor can gain that amount of uh, mining power? Yeah, it would. Yeah, it would. Uh, if, if one actor can acquire, first of all, you do have to have all the equipment. Uh, I, I don't know the particulars of that story. That's, I don't, I don't it's actually know. Years, I don't know if yeah. it's still the case or not, or if it's uh, just a fabrication by them. You can, if you're interested in knowing who's mining, uh, what's happened in Bitcoin in particular, uh, and every uh, cryptocurrency, that website there uh, that I showed earlier. Um, you can research each one and uh, type in a, a search, like a Google search, uh, mining pools, that's what they, they call it, mining pools. These are collections of uh, people around the world that are working together and then they share the mining reward, okay? So uh, if you look at the mine, yeah, you can look at Ethereum mining pools and they'll list it. That, that top link would be a good one. So what do we mean when we say mining? <coughs> when we say mining? So mining, uh, it's, uh, the, where the origin of that term comes back to um, a, a, a parallel with gold mining. Okay, so if you were to go out to the world and find some place and dig for gold, you would be rewarded for doing that. You were expending energy using uh, construction equipment and whatnot to dig it all out of the ground and process it. Of course, that's very labor uh, machine intensive. Well, that's where this comes in. When we say mining, it's like digging for gold, only where in this case, it's digital gold, if you will, okay? And the um, hard work here is providing this proof of work. Proof of work, algorithms. yes. So proving that you did the work to solve an algorithmic problem, and there's an, it keeps on going, there's, the algorithms keep getting progressively more difficult. Yeah, progressively more difficult. And the way these protocols, these are protocols. It's all like, it's like email. Email is a protocol, right? Uh, there's other internet protocols. Protocols are meant to be robust. They, follow a, a system and they just keep doing that over and over. So if you're mining on the Bitcoin protocol uh, and you're proving that you did the work and then you uh, broadcast that to the rest of the network, the rest of the network confirms, they check your work, okay? And, and that's what's, what also makes the network robust is that there's all these full nodes these n full nodes it means uh, 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 com com uh, computers that are keeping um, full records of the, the blockchain can you set for and they check the work okay so yeah, someone how, how are they incentivized the there is a, an incentive uh, like Bitcoin mining. to yes. verify so if I mined a quarter of a, of a Bitcoin and you would mine a full, you would get a full, uh, uh, like right now, the block reward. That means if you are successful in doing the proof of work, if you're successful in doing the proof of work and you broadcast that to the network and other nodes in the network confirm that your work is correct, they're, they're confirming that your math, that your computer did is correct, then that is called a confirmation. Uh, when if you now, if you're a person, a regular person trying to send a transaction, if your transaction it receives uh, six confirmations that it's made it into a block, <coughs> then that's considered to be now that transaction is considered to be immutable. You, uh, it, it's confirmed. Uh, yes, yeah. I, I know I'm kind of dancing around a little, a few things, trying to tie it together. And, essentially, uh, essentially what, what this is, in, in the case of a, a coin, a, a financial transaction, it's saying, I have made this purchase, I have transferred 
yay number of um, milli bitcoins yes. from Bob to Chris. Yes. Um, yeah. And here is my proof of work saying that it is so. Yes. And uh, and uh, the current mining reward for doing the proof of work uh, for a miner is 12 and a half bitcoins right now. That's and. Uh, the reward decreases over time. So this is why some people find Bitcoin as a currency, a money, is particularly interesting because the, the maximum amount of Bitcoins that will ever exist is 22 million, I believe. And comparing that to, hey, I'm gonna do something for shock value, okay? Uh, What's the difference between this $100 bill and a Bitcoin? Uh, yeah, that's one difference. But how about as a money, as a currency? I gave you a clue just a moment ago, actually. Yes, this is inflationary. Yes. That means the money supply gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So what that means to us as individuals is that the purchasing power of this $100 bill right now is decreasing by the second, by the minute. $100 uh, went a lot further in 1910 than it does now. Your purchasing power of a $100 bill is less because of supply. Now Bitcoin, is a, because it has a cap, at 22 million, it is what uh, economists and other people would say is a deflationary currency. So, uh, as the time as time progresses, there's less and less bitcoins being released into the world, and that keeps the value, the store of value, up. Okay. And it becomes harder to calculate the transactions. With it, okay? At the same time, that is occurring too. Yes. Um, you mentioned that you might be able to do some demos on uh, command line clients for like uh, command line operations you could do with say bitcoins. Uh, I don't uh, I don't uh, run any co command line uh, clients myself, but I can give you a website where you can uh, discover different wallets uh, that would run on different platforms, whatever and your you choice. Said, is. You said you might do some demos. Oh, there. did you? Did no, you no, want no, to do no, that? I was kind of hoping that you'd be able to do, oh. do, do such a demo. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. I, I have not ever used Bitcoin at all. Uh, there's yeah. a couple of, of local, you said the Ethereum inventor is a local guy. Yeah, he okay. went to U of W. There's a, a bunch of other and people who are involved locally with yeah. um, not so much Bitcoin itself, but uh, the Ripple Pay process and yep, doing uh, currency exchanges between the different uh, digital currencies. A couple of those guys were actually, um, you know, in in Kitchener. Uh, one of those. I took um, a, a course with them. Um, uh, Stephen Paul Weaver was uh, one of the guys who um, who worked on not Ripple Pay but something similar to that. Okay. And he was telling us that something about the uh, deflationary currency. Anyway, so he's the guy that would certainly have tools and, and utilities, and he's a Linux guy as well. So you'll have all those tools and utilities sure. available to, to do that sort of thing. Yeah, uh, you can, uh, certainly get let's pull up a website just yeah. so you can Go for see it. it. Uh, CryptoCompare.com. Yeah. This is like another good resource website. Uh, you can compare coins, exchanges, mining, wallets. Uh, let's go on wallets since that's what we're curious about here. And uh, yeah, let's click on that. And now we can uh, do, um, uh, as you scroll, you'll see uh, what, uh, what each wallet, uh, it's the platforms that it does. So there's your Linux, right? Mac, Windows, for that Ether wallet. And as you scroll, you'll see user ratings and how many people have rated it. Uh, and uh, in general, you want to just you want to go with the most popular wallets uh, and for the operating system. Uh, you can see like they rate them on anonymity, ease of use, and so forth. So one of the things here is that if you lose the digital data that represents the wallet, you've essentially lost your money. Yeah, so there's something with every wallet that is 
it's important to understand. Actually, I did make a video. Unfortunately, I probably won't be able to broadcast it here. Uh, in my apartment building, in the laundry room, there's a maintenance uh, uh, request uh, uh, a box. Okay, so you put in your little request, and this box it looks like a a, a mailbox. Okay, that you have on a, on the outside of your house. <laughs> the difference is is that there's a lock on it. Okay, that you would have to use a key to open up the mailbox to get into it. And because uh, you can slide a letter in only through the slot, uh, hopefully you're imagining what I'm saying. So you got a lid, you open up the lid and there's a slot, you could stick stuff into the mailbox. But if you ever wanted to pull anything out of the mailbox, you'd have to use a key to open it up. This is exactly the visual analogy of what a wallet is. Okay, so in these crypto uh, wallets, um, it doesn't matter what uh, interface it is, uh, uh, like, or what operating system, they all have these two things. One is called a public address, also known as a public key. That is the slot that you can put stuff into. If someone knows your public address, kind of like your email address, they can send you an email, all right? In this case, let's say it's money, Bitcoin, they're sending you money into your address, okay? Uh, that's the pub, and they call it public key because you need to have a, a key uh, uh, that allows it to go in. Now, the other side of the wallet is what's called a private key, a pri uh, and that's something you control. Uh, different wallets allow you to uh, back up your wallet and to help you, let's say if your machine is busted, okay, so you, you're, uh, uh, you're, let's say you only had a wallet that was on your phone, it wasn't on your computer, and you dropped your phone in the toilet. Well, if you save, the, there's some, in some of the process of uh, creating your wallet, it'll create, a, create what's called a seed. And a seed is a string of words, about 12 words usually, and they're randomized. And that is your, and when you uh, enter, it'll ask you, the process of signing, creating the wallet will say, okay, write down these words. And sometimes they might say, uh, please uh, re-enter these words to, pr to back up your wallet. Typically what you do is you'll take that seed and you'll write it down on paper and you store it somewhere safe, okay? This has, it gives you access to the private key. Now, if you really want to, you could, in the wallet, display your private key. And again, that's, that's gonna be like your public address, your public key, a long string of letters and numbers. And if someone has that, they can take your Bitcoin. So when you run uh, a wallet, the wallet recognizes that you are, that you have, you're, you're operating it, so now you have control of the private key. So you're allowed to make transactions. Does one then have to put one's wallet somewhere publicly accessible as they would in the physical world? Or does my wallet reside on a thumb drive that I keep around my neck or something, and if you wanted to deposit into that, you could do that, and then next time I update, yes. it shows up. If I know your public address on your thumb drive type thing, and by the way, there are hardware wallets, and these there's different styles of wallets. That's a good thing to branch into with this, this question. So there are, uh, uh, full nodes, which you keep the complete record of the blockchain. That's something on a computer, your laptop. That's going to be a lot of space, like with Bitcoin, about 150 gigs uh, of space. Then you have uh, simplified payment verification wallets. So that means wallets on mobile devices. What that and what those wallets are, the difference between a full node and a simplified payment verification (SPV). Well, is that it only, ch it doesn't keep a complete record of the blockchain. It goes to the more current, it syncs up with the more current history. Once it has that, then it's considered that it's, uh, that's good enough. 
and then you can uh, transact through the network. Um, typically, these SPV wallets will connect with other full nodes. Okay, uh, that's the way I understand it. And uh, then you can uh, do that. So Jax Wallet is one that I use. I use that one. This is a this is developed by people in Toronto. Um, it's nice because it is multi-currency. They they are currency agnostic, which I, I appreciate because uh, you know they're not saying that Bitcoin is the only thing, and there are people <coughs> out there that will that are known affectionately as Bitcoin maximalists. It's Bitcoin or nothing. <laughs> I don't believe that. I believe that there's still innovation happening, and these guys do too. Uh, and they uh, so here's a here's another thing to. Uh, if you scroll down a little bit, Bob, right here, this is this is an important thing. A higher, hierarchical deterministic wallet. Uh, what that means is that, that that relates to generating the seed, but with that phrase. And then uh, let's say your device broke down and then you got a new device and you loaded up the software, you could just type in that seed and it will sync up with what you had before. So it's like your backup phrase. Does, does the wallet contain the entire blockchain? Only a full node. Uh, a full node that's downloaded the entire blockchain. That would be uh, the Bitcoin. So in Bitcoin, they call it the Bitcoin core wallet. Or some of these other ones, they call it the, the core wallet. That's the whole thing. So and the, then, wallet, the wallet that I have for my own personal transactions would not have the entire blockchain. Most people are not doing that. They're not do. Uh, uh, downloading the entire blockchain. I really, I really only need the transactions that I've participated in. Yes, yeah, so uh, I've got a Jax wallet on here. It has no Bitcoin or anything on it currently. I've, I can show you that I've performed transactions and uh, very small ones. Just it, it was early on when I was just testing it out. I wanted to see uh, how it worked and before I actually put anything significant into it. And I do have skin in the game, by the way, full disclosure. I do have my own, I've invested some of my own money into this stuff. Into the technology or into- uh, the I've actually purchased, system? I've purchased Bitcoin and I've purchased other altcoins as they're known. <laughs> do they still have ATM, mach uh, ATM machines where you can go and uh, yes. deposit and withdraw? Because I know they set yes. up in Vancouver. There's one uh, at the pub on King. I've not actually transacted there, but there's one inside the door where there's, uh, and then there, I heard that there's two other ATMs. I've actually had a brief conversation with the, the owner through Kijiji because he had, he advertises his Bitcoin ATM on Kijiji. So, um, but yeah, I have a Jack's wallet here. Um, and yes, it will keep, uh, uh, it'll show me what transactions I've performed. So approximately how large is that wallet in size? In size? Wallet? Oh yeah, that's a good question. Uh, let's see. I'll check my settings here and see how big that is. How much real estate it takes up. Storage. An interesting use of blockchain technology, although it might have been a bit of a joke, I think it was on April Fool's Day, but the register.co.uk online tech magazine uh, published a story saying that what they were going to start doing was in their pages having JavaScript run that was going to basically do mining. So as you browse their site, instead right. of an ad model, your computer would do some Bitcoin type mining submitting the results to the publisher so that they got yeah uh, there are the routers i've heard of routers uh wireless routers that will mine or try to mine uh if you'd have to be extremely lucky for that router to have to actually and, solve the yeah. problem I think like, that it actually costs more in electricity yes oh yeah you would be losing money yeah, that's what I would <laughs> it say. would be warming your house yeah. <laughs> is what it does. they did this as an april fool's joke and, and yeah. the consensus seemed to be in the comments the commentators would, as they say, thought that it was actually a good idea, whether or not it was achievable, and you wouldn't want that if you were surfing on your phone or something. But yeah. by and large, people said, yeah, I, I donate CPU cycles to a online publication that I 
like to respect it. So, so I just checked the Jax wallet on my iPad here takes up 34.7 megabytes. That's nothing. Per. That's nothing. Yeah. So that's where most people are going to, to do it. Now, uh, so wallets, there's another thing that we should talk about. There's hot wallets and cold wallets. Hot wallets means it's connected to the internet. Cold wallet, not connected. So if you are, you know, feeling adventurous and you want to put skin in the game, and I mean like significant amounts, you want to protect that. And ideally you want to have it in a cold wallet. That can be in a hardware wallet, kind of, kind of, sort of what you described in a way. There's, there are stuff, we could get into that if we, I could show you some yeah, sites. Probably not much time. Okay. And then there are simple cold wallets, which are paper wallets. So if you went to this ATM, uh, for instance, up at the pub on King, and you bought some, ink, some Bitcoin there, you could say, well, print me a paper wallet. And that paper wallet ha will have your public address. So you could send more Bitcoin to that wallet. It'll also have your private key, your private address. It's on the other side. There's always two parts and there are QR codes for both. So this was what happened just a few years ago. A news broadcaster went on with a, with a, a paper Bitcoin wallet and he said, hey, look, I got some Bitcoin. <laughs> well, someone took their device while this was happening in real time, scanned the QR code while it was happening and stole that guy's $20 in Bitcoin or whatever it was. And that's how he's, because he didn't know. He gave it away, didn't he? He essentially gave it away without, but he didn't know he was, yeah. he just didn't know that that, there's the two sides of the wallet. And as soon as you publish your private key, that means someone can take it, whatever it is. So you have to guard that. Okay, let's get into yeah. the game. Yeah. Um, we're all members of, of Nonprofit organizations. We want to get our nonprofit organizations uh, living in the future. I want to put a donate my Bitcoin button on my website. You don't even need to do a button. You can just put your address. Okay, but yeah, from you, from from yeah. my perspective as a sure. nonprofit to administrator, sure. What do I need to do to get your donation into his pocket? Because he's yeah, uh, so let's uh, if you if you. Put a Bitcoin wallet. Let's say you want to do just deal with Bitcoin. You, you can do other stuff to mm -hmm. like with to, to accept the other currencies, and sure. I'll mention that in a second. But let's say it's just your Bitcoin wallet. Um, these uh, uh, you have your public address. You copy and paste that into your web page. Okay, it's obviously up to you as the web administrator to make sure that your website's not going to get hacked or take the necessary precautions. And all you have to do is pub publish your public address. And then someone, let's say they have Bitcoin, they want to donate that to you. Yeah. They copy that string of letters and numbers. They put that into the to field on their wallet. They decide how much they want to send, click send, Does and then it will arrive in your wallet some point. And it wouldn't even matter if your website was hacked. If you are keeping your wallet a cold wallet or an offline wallet? It doesn't matter. It doesn't it, yeah, matter. It, it, it could be a cold wallet, it could be a paper wallet. So, if you took it, the issue is that if your if your website gets hacked, a hacker can put their public address on there. Yeah, they will sure, change it. Sure, but it that's, will, you that's, won't lose what you've already got. Exactly. And this is your public address, which means if someone copied it, that doesn't give them access to your funds. The best they can do is give you more money. <laughs> That's exactly it. That's the best they can do is give you more money. They cannot take, because you're not publishing your private key, which is what they use to take your funds. So, okay. so what needs to happen mm -hmm. to get that money from this wallet? You know, the, if, especially if it's a gold wallet, what, what do I need to do as a system of ministry? Let's, let's visit another website just to give a visual, okay? So uh, I'm going to take you to a website which is having to do with uh, the controversy going on in Bitcoin, but there's also a public address at the bottom for people who want to accept uh, the donations. So segwit, S-E-G-W-I-T dot C-O. No. Uh, oh, let's Inappropriate see. content. That's weird. Yeah, we strictly covering uh, potentially unwanted programs. Probably some JavaScript-ish thing in the back there. Let me just make sure that that's the correct address. I think that's correct. Yeah. It might be .io. It could be .io. So this is probably some domain squatter then trying to take advantage of the 
similar address. Parking crew? No. This is a oh, it's it's not CEO. Okay, uh, maybe if we go back to Coin Market Cap, that might actually be a good one. They might have a donate mm -hmm. button at the bottom. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes Google Cash will get around those too. Sometimes. Okay, let's scroll to the very bottom. It's probably there. This guy is, does this out of the goodness of his own heart. And uh, yeah, keep going. There's going to be like a hundred. <laughs> People tend to put them at the bottom of their pages. And I'm not, there could be one here. Ah, there it is. Donate. Yeah, so there it is. Um, that's all you got to do. Put that. That's it. That's it. And here's a clickable link. That's a clickable link. Uh, that might link? take you to a block explorer, which tells you. Oh, oh yeah, there, there. So if you wanted to, yeah. So you could do this, where it gives you the QR code. So your wallet, then, your wallet yeah. software may have. Oh, yeah, it'll have a QR reader, like the Jack's wallet does. I could scan this, and that would pull up that address, that string of letters and numbers, yeah. and then I decide how much I want to send to that address. So yeah, you could you could do this very easy. Um, it doesn't have to be more clear than that because somehow <laughs> that money has to get into somebody's pocket. It, it gets into your your pocket. Yeah, but the, your wallet. And, and and there's no systems administration department. There's no there's no technology. But I have to use a commercial wallet or a, a client a, a right. readily available. Yeah. Yeah, like that website was a right. good resource. Exactly. You could find a wallet that you okay. you think is good, and then load that onto your device, if it's your laptop or your phone or whatever, you know. It, we talked about paper wallets that you, so if I went to the pub on King and I bought some Bitcoin there, it's gonna, and I say print a paper wallet, it's gonna give me one of these addresses. And I and let's say I publish that address on my website and now anytime someone sends me Bitcoin, it goes into my paper wallet. Cold storage. I put this in a special place, a safe, Something that you trust, like a special place. You can bury it. I don't care what you do with it. Put it on your bed. Uh, it doesn't matter. If someone gets a hold of your address, copies and pastes that into their, their own uh, wallet, they decide how much they want to send. It's a buck or two or whatever. So really, in order to, to yeah. enable this in a nonprofit situation, um, it's really uh, an administrative process by the financial people that have to do all the hard work. Systems administrators have nothing to do with this. Yeah, like you just decide to publish your address and that's it. And uh, um, like what was mentioned, I think, who was it, uh, Robert maybe, uh, that uh, if, if a hacker got to your website, hacked into your website, the best they could do is just change that address. And so that someone, and so you want to acknowledge that your address hasn't changed. Um, uh, make sure that that happens. Right. And, and that's the only way a hacker would steal, uh, steal from right. you, is by changing the address to their wallet but from right. your wallet, okay? So that's it, but it's very, very easy. Now, um, uh, I will give you another uh, website that's very, uh, let's do this lastly before we close up. Shapeshift.io. Shape. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, okay. I think there's no words. Yeah, no words. Shape shift.io. Yes. This is another excellent resource site. Uh, this allows people to uh, change from one currency to another. Uh, they offer up in uh, tools, API and tools, um, uh, a place where you can uh, say uh, the shifty button. That's it there. And what this is, is a neat little button that you can put on your website. And you say, you, if you scroll down, it'll, I think, uh, here we go. So you decide, okay, uh, button type. Let's say, uh, oh, this is the style of the way the button looks like. Get paid in this coin, uh, change that. Uh, um, actually, pay coin. with altcoins, that's it, okay. So, so see where it says pay with altcoins? That's the button that's gonna appear on your website. And then you choose which coin you actually want to receive. So if they pay with whatever their currency of choice is, it will tr it'll automatically be, tr uh, uh, Shapeshift will change it into the currency of your choice. So Doge is the current one, you could be, uh, well, there's a whole pile of them on that drop box, that, that drop down box. So if you wanted to receive Bitcoin or Dash or Ethereum or whatever, you choose that. 
you you sign up um, you, for affiliate stuff if you wanted. Uh, you give them your public key, so that's your public address. What we saw on the previous website that had that just that string of letters and numbers, you would put that into that field there, the public API key, and then uh, generate code, uh, and then cut and paste that code, throw that onto your website, and that'll produce that button right there. So. So that would be ideal for someone who was wanting to receive, uh, as a nonprofit, wanting to receive monies from anywhere in the world. Uh, and then, of course, we all know that once you have these currencies, you can send them anywhere in the world. You're not restricted, and and uh, some transact, uh, some of the uh, some can happen much more instantaneously than uh, Bitcoin. By the way, uh, Dash is one. Uh, you can, uh, they allow instant transactions. That means instant is like one to three seconds. Uh, Ripple is, by the way, is something completely different. It's very, very quick. Like, very, uh, it's not um, uh, the, the same animal as the <coughs> others that are on that website, uh, CoinMarketCap. I'll use another to, to talk about the exchanges as well, because yes, um, so I mean, there was a big crash in what 2013 or so. Uh, right, everybody was so, investing all their money that they ever had in the world. Mount the Gox was a big exchange. Yeah. Did you what did you lose on? Uh, I hate to point you out, but it's uh, for that, like, uh, Vertrex and uh, Vertrex, Cri yeah. Cripsy, Cripsy was another, yeah, and some other random one that, that like I tried going to their website like six months later, just like deadly, yeah. Yeah, so if you're doing your homework on these exchanges, uh, you want to know how are they keeping the majority of the funds, and and most of them, some of them now are keeping the majority of the funds in what's cold storage. So that means it's not connected to the internet. It's uh, either on a hardware device or you know, likely a hardware device. Um, there's a number of devices. That, so, to get, so to get that funds into the nonprofit's financial system, yes. and that's also required that it's the administration work. Yeah, so uh, like, are you thinking converting back to national currency? Oh, yeah. That work? Okay, okay. Yes. yes, yes, there is some, some work that needs to be done to do that. So, uh, um, th but it's getting easier and easier to do that. So there's a new service called Abra. Abra is a way that you can accept Bitcoins like a, in a, like what we, kind of what we're talking about here with an address, you give someone an address, they send you Bitcoins, and then in the Abra wallet, you can decide, okay, I actually really want Canadian currency. So it, the moment they send you Bitcoin, or even any other national currency for that matter, they can send you any currency to from an Abra wallet to another Abra wallet. This is brand new, just in the last few months. Very, very cool. Uh, anyone sends you whatever currency, including Bitcoin, uh, to your Abra wallet, you decide what you actually want. So if they're paying in Swiss francs, you want Canadian dollars, they do the conversion for you. And then where you get charged, a fee for this service is when you decide to take the Canadian funds out of your Abra wallet and put it into your bank account, your wherever you are, TD, Bebo, whatever, okay? It would have been great if we had our extra half hour. Because and yeah, I'm open to uh, to coming again if, if yeah. you guys want to do this again and to have more questions. So. Something I do want to cover quickly with the group we've got here is to figure out what we want to do next time. Um, because obviously we have um, a bunch of things that, that we want to talk about in the future. So here we go, request of topics. Um, I have on the list for soon um, talking about um, off-site storage, um, GPSs, uh, remote locations, co-location, things like that. So that's um, not scheduled for a date yet. But is there anything on the list here that people are particularly interested in? Is there anything on the list? Is there anything that's not on the list that people want to talk about in the next couple of weeks, next couple of months, rather? If not, I'll arbitrarily choose something off the list, and you'll have to put up with it. Sounds good. <laughs> okay. All right. And so yeah, I think um, I mean there's all the, the non-financial watching stuff I'd love to yes, talk about. Yes, authentication is, and yes, there's some more uh, stuff that we could get into. Yeah. Um, there, uh, for instance, uh, file storage. If you want yeah. to, uh, if you don't trust the cloud, you can use a blockchain technology to shard your files and then 
it's all encrypted and then later if you want to reconstitute those files you can do that there's a couple services again that website is the coin market cap you'll find those services those ones on there uh, one is called SIA and one is called storage with a J S T O R J uh, and what's nice about that one web the website is they will provide you with the official links and I I actually recommend people go to that website and not do a Google search for the the same reason that that presenter in that video said there's a lot of scams out there uh, and they'll uh, people that are presenting wallets and different things and it's easy to, get to think that you're at an official website and you're not <laughs> so always try to Go figure out the trusted uh, websites first and then visit the, the official foundations and whatnot uh, and get your information there. And that's a good one to start with. Yeah. Okay, so I'll probably hit you up for a list of those links. Sure. Um, I've got them still sitting yeah. there. Um, and I'll write up the, um, the notes as best I can because I didn't actually take that many notes. I was far too interested in listening to you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much. Hey, Thank you. Yeah, it was a pleasure to meet you guys. Yeah.